Hello everybody and welcome to our video on the dot product. So the dot product is going to be a new operation uh, that we're going to define between two vectors. So in this case a and b where a has the vector coordinates a1, a2, a3 and b's components are b1, b2, and b3. Uh, then the dot product of a and b is the number so a dot b that results from multiplying a1 b1 plus a2 b2 plus a3 b3. So in other words, we multiply the corresponding components and add all three results together. <clears throat> now that may seem like a sort of arbitrary operation to define, but we'll see momentarily that it actually has pretty big significance in terms of um, the visualization of these vectors and how they interact. So let's just start with a simple example though, a dot b here. So if we're taking the dot product of these two vectors, we're just gonna take six times two plus negative two times five, plus three times negative one. That's 12 minus 10, which is two, minus three, which is negative one. So let's take a look at a couple quick properties for the dot product. So first of all, the dot product of a vector times itself is equal to the magnitude squared. So let's think about that. If I take the dot product of a1, a2, a3 with itself, well, that's going to give me exactly, uh, well, let's multiply it out. We get a1 squared plus a2 squared plus a3 squared. And that is exactly the square of the square root of these things, right? So that's the magnitude of A squared. So this property comes up a lot and uh, we'll use it fairly frequently for different manipulations. So it's one you definitely wanna pay extra attention to. Now, property two here is just that the order of the dot product doesn't matter. And this should make sense because once you multiply your individual components together, uh, here we're just looking at multiplication and addition, and the order of each pair of multiplication doesn't matter here. Now, another interesting property that we're not going to show uh, carefully is a dot the sum of b plus c equals a dot b plus a dot c. So essentially there is a distributive property for the dot product. Now it wouldn't be hard too hard to see that if you just set up three vectors a, b, and c, and then you took the sum of b and c first and dotted a with it, uh, you'll see that you get the same result that you would get if you first dotted a with each vector individually and then added them. We'll skip that here for time though. Uh, what else do we get? We get that a constant multiple of the vector a dotted with b is the same thing as the constant multiple of the dot product of those two vectors first. So this just says we could have taken this dot product first and then multiplied it by the constant c. There wouldn't be a difference here. Similarly, we could have multiplied this constant by b first and then taken the dot product with a and still get the same thing. Lastly, the dot product of the zero vector with a is the zero vector. So now we can see the geometric relationship that's exposed by the dot product. And uh, it's a pretty important relationship, as we'll see. So if theta is the angle between vectors a and b, then the dot product of a and b is equal to the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times cosine of theta. So 
What this tells you is that we can actually figure out what the angle between vectors are if we can take the dot product of those two vectors, right? That gives us a relationship between the vectors uh, component forms and the actual angle between them that's pretty direct. So let's take a look at the proof of this. It's not too bad. Let theta be the angle between vectors a and b, and then we apply the law of cosines to the triangle that we've drawn here, and we get that the magnitude of a minus b squared equals the magnitude of a squared plus the magnitude of b squared minus 2 times the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times cosine of theta. So again, this is just the law of cosines from trigonometry, just applied to this triangle formed by these three vectors. Now notice that we know already that the vector, uh, the magnitude of a vector squared is the dot product of the vector times itself. So what we're doing here is just rewriting this expression, the left side of this equation. So we take this dot product, and we know that this dot product distributes. So the first thing we're doing, we can think of this like, and I kind of skipped this step here, so we can think of it like we distribute the a vector times the vector a minus b, dotted with the vector a minus b, minus the b vector dotted with a minus b. So like we're distributing each component here first, or each ve individual vector here first, and then taking these respective uh, dot products. And each of these will distribute accordingly, which is why we get a dot a, minus a dot b, minus b dot a. And uh, I didn't really want that to run over like that, so let me just move this down here for clarity a little bit. So we get a dot a minus a dot b, and then the product of the second expression here gives us negative b dot a plus b dot b, and then we see that the dot product here is the magnitude squared of a, the dot product here is the magnitude of b squared, and these middle ones are both the same vector result, or the same dot product, so we just get negative 2 times the dot product. So that is to say that this right-hand side of this equation is equal to this expression, right? Both of these are equal to a minus b's uh, magnitude squared. So if we set those two equations equal to one another here, we can cancel out the magnitude of a and the magnitude of b squared. And then once we have that, we can divide each side by negative 2. And that gives us our result that the dot product of a and b is equal to the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times cosine of theta. So we're going to make a whole lot of use of this throughout this course. So this is definitely one you want to you know, pay less special attention to and make sure you uh, really master this identity. So let's take a look at an example here. Find the angle between A and B. So we know that A dot B is equal to the magnitude of A times the magnitude of b times cosine of the angle between them. And just to, let's make this dot extra emphasized. So this is multiplication because these two are numbers. This here is the dot product operation on vectors. So it can be a little bit confusing sometimes. You got to really think about the context of what you're looking at in terms of whether it's a dot product or scalar product, etc. So what we need is the dot product and both magnitudes, and that'll allow us to solve for theta here. So first we'll take the dot product. A dot B is going to be 4 times 2 plus 0 times negative 1 plus 2 times 0, which is just 8. The magnitude of A... It's going to be the square root of 4 squared plus 0 squared plus 2 squared, which is, that's 16 plus 4, which is 20, so that's the square root of 20. 
And that can be uh, simplified a little bit to the square root of 5 times 4, on which becomes 2 times the square root of 5. And the magnitude of b will be the square root of 2 squared plus negative 1 squared plus 0 squared. So that's the square root of 4 plus 1, which is just the square root of 5. All right, so if we plug this all in, what do we get? We get 8 equals 2 root 5 times root 5 times cosine of theta. That gives us 10 here, right? Square root of 5 times square root of 5 is 5 times 2 is 10. 8 divided by 10 is 4 fifths. So 4 fifths equals cosine of theta. And that tells us that cosine inverse of 4 fifths is equal to theta. But I'll leave it to you to plug that into a calculator. Okay, so here we've been asked to find the dot product between a and b, given that the magnitude of a is 3, the magnitude of b is the square root of 6, and the angle between the vectors is 45 degrees. Well, this theorem gives us pretty clearly that the dot product is equal to the product of these magnitudes times cosine of 45 degrees. So that's 3 times root 6 times square root of 2 over 2. This gives us 3 halves times the square root of 12. 12 is 4 times 3, so I can make this 3 over 2 times 2 root 3, and cancel those 2's. So that gives me 3 root 3. All right, that's it for example 3. Moving on, so we've got a new definition here, but really it's an old definition. Two non-zero vectors, A and B, are called perpendicular or orthogonal if the angle between them is theta equals pi over 2. So really the only difference here is that we're not only talking about vectors in two dimensions now, so it would be kind of obvious to call vectors in two dimensions orthogonal in this case if the angle is pi over 2. But they're also, we use the same language, orthogonal or perpendicular, in three dimensions as well. Now, a fact that we get out of this theorem, you might call it a corollary, is that two vectors, a and b, are orthogonal if and only if their dot product is zero. So let's just look at this real quick. The result of our theorem says that the dot product equals the product of the magnitudes times cosine of theta. But if these vectors are non-zero, then the only way this result can be zero is if cosine of theta is zero. And in that case, theta is going to have to be pi over 2. So if theta is pi over 2, then the two vectors are perpendicular or orthogonal. So now let's take a look at another example. Determine whether the given vectors are orthogonal. Well, we're just going to start by taking the dot product. So here we've used the bold notation instead of the arrow notation. Again, these can be interchanged at will. So we get negative 3 times 4 plus 9 times negative 12 plus 6 times negative 8. And, of course, we're just doing the part i here. This is negative 12 minus, so 90 and 18, so that's 108, so negative 108 minus 48. And this is definitely not 0, so these are definitely not orthogonal. All right, for our second case, now just keep in mind here that if nothing's written here, that means these are all 1. So when we take our dot product, we'll get 1 times 2.
plus negative 1 times negative 1 plus 2 times 1. That's 2 plus 1 plus 2. That's 5, which is also non zero. So this is not orthogonal either. Okay, so now we're going to talk about something a little more involved here, which are vector projections. So take a look at this diagram here. We've got a few different vectors. We have vector A, which represents the entire vector here on the bottom part of this diagram. Vector B, which is this vector uh, pointing up at this angle. And we have this vector here from P to S, which is what we call the projection of B onto A. So you can think of this like if the sun was shining directly above your vector. What's the shadow that get ca gets cast by this vector, right? Well, in this case, it's exactly this, projection of B onto A. So how can we find this vector projection? Well, let's start by defining something else, the scalar projection of B onto A, which we also call the component of B along A. So we define this as the signed magnitude of the vector projection. Well, that just means the length of this component, right? So the signed magnitude of the vector projection is the length along with if it's positive or negative. If it's in the positive direction, it'd be positive. If it's in the negative direction, it would be negative. Well, we can use a little bit of basic trigonometry for that. If we know that this angle is theta, and we call this magnitude down here, so let's call the magnitude of PS. The magnitude of this line, let's write that one more time, that's pretty terrible. All right, there we go, much better. Uh, we've got this magnitude of the ray from P to S. Well, this is my adjacent, which makes this my hypotenuse, and that sounds like cosine to me, right? So, PS divided by the hypotenuse should be equal to cosine of theta. But if we rewrite that a little bit, I should say the magnitude would be there. If we rewrite that and multiply this magnitude across, it tells us the length of this line is the magnitude of the vector B times cosine of theta. And we call this the component, again, of B along A, or the scalar projection. All that means is the length of this shadow of this vector. Now, we can simplify the expression for this component. I say simplify, but really I mean provide an alternative to this formula. So both of these formulas are totally valid and useful. So sometimes this first formula is more useful but sometimes the second form is more useful. So let's take a look. Using that previous theorem we had about the dot product, we know that a dot b is the magnitude of a times the magnitude of b times cosine of theta, which tells me that if I divide the magnitude of a across, then I have that the magnitude of b times cosine of theta is equal to the dot product of a and b divided by the magnitude of a which is to say that the scalar projection can also be written as the dot product of A and B divided by A's magnitude. So again, we're just saying that these two things are equivalent and you can use either form depending on the context. If you only know one vector, the vector B, and you know the angle theta, well then you use the second form. And if you know the two vectors but you don't know the angle, you use the first form.
Now, since the projection of B onto A is a vector with length, the component of B along A, and the same direction as A, then you get the vector projection of B onto A as the product of the length. So this is the component times the unit vector in the direction of A. Okay, and this is, we've been doing examples involving this before. Multiply the length times a unit vector. That gives you a vector in the same direction with your new length. So that's all we're doing here. The result gives us A dot B divided by the magnitude of A squared times the vector A. So, this next example, we're going to find the scalar and vector projections of B onto A. So, the scalar projection given by comp B onto A. Since we have both vectors, we're going to use this first form of it, and we're going to take the dot product of A and B and divide it by A's magnitude. The dot product is simple enough. That's 3 times 1 plus 6 times 2 plus negative 2 times 3 divided by the magnitude, which will be the square root of 3 squared plus 6 squared plus negative 2 squared. This gives us 3 plus 12. That's 15 minus 6. So that's 9 divided by the square root of 9 plus 36, that's 45, plus 4 more, that's 49. So this is 9 sevenths. Now, again, you always want to use the form that makes the most sense for the context. And in this context, we've already found the component of B along A. So what makes most sense is actually to use this separated product here, since I've already done this computation. So in this case, for the projection, I'm just going to take this component, 9 sevenths, and multiply it by my vector A. Divided by my magnitude of A which we already calculated out to be 7. So in other words, this is 9 over 49 times the vector 3, 6, negative 2. And if I distribute this, I'll get the vector 27, 49, 54, 49, and negative 18, 49. And that's it. That's my projection. Okay, so let's go ahead and move along here to another example. So here we've got a tow truck drags a stalled car along a road. The chain makes an angle of 30 degrees with the road. And the tension in the chain is 1,500 newtons. How much work is done by the truck in pulling the car one kilometer? Well, first, let's keep in mind when we talk about work, we usually mean in units of newton meters. So it'd be 1,000 meters that we want to worry about here. And if we draw a little diagram here of a truck, I know my, my truck is beautiful and Here's its like towing mechanism thing. And here's a great car. I mean, I get accolades all the time for my drawing capabilities, if you could not guess. So, your truck is pulling the car. This angle is 30 degrees. The magnitude of this force is 1500 newtons. And the distance, the magnitude of the distance vector, 
because remember, we're dealing with vectors here, but we do know the magnitudes of both of these. So 1,500 newtons and 1,000 meters. So how can we solve this? Well, it's not too bad, right? Work is the dot product of force and distance, but we know from that theorem that this can be expressed as the product of their magnitudes times cosine of theta. In this case, 30 degrees. So that's 1,500 newtons times 1,000 meters times cosine of 30 degrees, which is the square root of 3 over 2. 1,500 divided by 2 is 750. 750 times 1,000 is 750,000 times radical 3 newton meters. And you can just leave that in that form. That's an exact answer. Well, that's it for this section on the dot product. Thank you for watching.